Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, you all are welcome to the 15th session of the course of administrative law. In continuation to the modes of judicial review, in the present lecture we are going to discuss the writ of mandamus and the writ of habeas corpus. In earlier lecture we discussed about the writ of shashurari, the writ of prohibition, and the writ of co warranto. Writ of mandamus and the writ of habeas corpus, these are also very important modes of judicial review of administrative action. When we talk about the meaning and definition of writ of mandamus, it seems that the writ of mandamus is not the writ of right unlike the writ of prohibition. Under the writ of prohibition, we have seen that prohibition is the writ of right, whereas the mandamus, it is the matter of discretion of the court to issue the writ or not, it cannot be claimed as the matter of right. The term mandamus is a Latin term which means be command and in English it means mandate. Writ of mandamus is the name of one of the writs under common law. It is issued by superior court to a lower court or any governmental authority to perform public duties. It is a formal order issued by the court to an authority to do or to refrain from doing some specific act which it is legally obliged to do. According to Black's Law Dictionary, the mandamus is a writ issued by a court to compel the performance of a particular act by lower court or a governmental officer or body to correct a prior action or failure to act. According to Wharton Law Lexicon, 15th edition 2009, the mandamus is a high prerogative writ of a most extensive remedial nature. In form, it is a command issuing in the king's name from the king's bench division of high court only and addressed to any person, corporation or inferior court of judicature requiring them to do something therein specified, which appertains to their office and which the court holds to be consonant to right and justice. It is used principally for public purposes. It enforces, however, some private rights when they are withheld by the public officers. Under the meaning given by Wharton's law lexicon, there are some important features of writ of mandamus. The writ of mandamus is the prerogative of the high courts and the Supreme Court of India. Writ of mandamus is used for the performance of the public duties of the governmental authorities or the governmental bodies. Writ of mandamus is the most extensive remedial remedy and therefore, the writ of mandamus is also called as the judicial remedy. It is the residual remedy under the power of or under the concept of judicial review. All the writs are issued for a specific purpose, but the mandamus can be issued for the performance of any kind of public duty which is owned by any administrative authority. Mandamus is a judicial remedy issued in the form of an order of the Supreme Court or High Court 
to any constitutional statutory or non statutory agency to do or to forbear from doing some specific act which that agency is obliged to do or refrain from doing under the law and which is in the nature of a public duty or statutory duty. This definition of mandamus, this meaning of mandamus was given by Professor I. P. Massey in his book Administrative Law, which is published by Eastern Book Company, Lucknow. According to the formulation to the meaning given to the writ of mandamus, I. P. Massey is of the opinion that writ of mandamus is a judicial remedy in the form of the order of high court or the supreme court to any constitutional statutory or non statutory agency for what purpose to do to do or forbear from doing some specific act which that agency is obliged to do or refrain from doing under the law and which is in the nature of a public duty or statutory duty. Out of this formulation, out of this meaning given by Professor I. P. Massey, we can point out some essential elements of writ of mandamus or we can find out some essential conditions for the issuance of the writ of mandamus, meaning thereby that the writ of mandamus can be issued only when these conditions are fulfilled. What are these conditions which may, may point out out of the meaning given to the writ of mandamus by Professor I. P. Massey? These are number one that the writ of mandamus is a judicial remedy in the form of the order of the high court or the supreme court of India. So, the writ of mandamus is a judicial remedy and that judicial remedy can be provided only by the high court or the supreme court of India. It also means that only the higher judiciary can issue the writ of mandamus. Only the higher judiciary is entitled, is empowered to issue the writ of mandamus. Number two, this writ of mandamus is issued to any constitutional agency any statutory agency or even to any non statutory agency. What are the constitutional agencies which are created by the constitution or which are under the control of the constitution? What are the statutory agencies which are created by the statute itself or by any law made by the parliament? Non statutory duties, non statutory agencies are also within the scope of writ of mandamus. We can refer to the meaning of a state under article 12, wherein the even non-statutory agencies are considered as a state for the purpose of enforcement of fundamental rights, if these non-statutory agencies have some trappings of the state or these are considered to be the agencies or instrumentalities of the state. What test is applied to a certain whether a non statutory agency is a state or not, whether the non statutory agency is coming under the meaning of a state or not, the different tests have been evolved which we have already discussed under the meaning of a state. So, the second important aspect of writ of mandamus is that it has very wider scope. It can be issued against the constitutional bodies, against the statutory bodies and even against the non-statutory bodies. The third element or the third important condition which is required to be fulfilled by for the issue of the writ of mandamus is that this writ is issued to any constitutional statutory or non statutory agency for what purpose to do or to forbear from doing some specific act. This is the most important part of 
the writ of mandamus that it is issued to any constitutional non constitutional statutory or non statutory body for what purpose to do or to forbear from doing some specific act or something it means that the writ of mandamus is a command is a direction to any constitutional body to any statutory body or to any non statutory body to do some specific act or not to do to forbear from doing to refrain from doing any specific act which that agency is obliged to do the writ of mandamus can be issued only the performance of any such specific act which the agency is obliged to do or refrain from doing under the law the writ of mandamus cannot be issued for any kind of for any for the performance of any such kind of act which that agency is not obliged to do under any law so this is very important or essential condition for the writ of mandamus that for the performance of only those acts for which the agency is obliged to do or to forbear from doing under the law and which is in the nature of a public duty or statutory duty it is not sufficient for the issue of the writ of mandamus that there was a constitutional statutory or non statutory agency that agency was obliged to do certain act or that agency was obliged to refrain from doing any particular act in addition to this it is also required that that act which the agency is obliged to do must be the public act must be in the form of public duty it must be in the form of a statutory duty so only for the performance of the statutory duties and public duties the writ of mandamus is issued the writ of mandamus is considered to be general and residuary remedy of public law because as i told you that all the other writs are issued for some specific objective for some specific purpose for example the writ of co warranto is issued to know the justification for a person to hold any particular public office or to remove the unqualified or unentitled persons from any public office writ of habeas corpus is issued for the release of any detained person if the detention is found illegal the writ of certiorari is issued to examine whether any particular authority is exceeding from its jurisdiction which has been conferred on it by the law but the writ of mandamus is the general remedy for any kind of performance of public duty the writ of mandamus can be issued and therefore it is also called as the residuary remedy what remains after the scope of the other writs all such is included within the scope of the writ of mandamus thus whenever any person is denied justice the writ of mandamus lies on the basis of this discussion over the meaning and definition of writ of mandamus we can point out or we can find some essential conditions on the fulfillment of which the writ of mandamus can be issued these essential conditions or conditions of the writ of mandamus are number 1 there must be a public duty number 2 that public duty must be substantive in nature this can also be made the part of the first condition that there must be the public duty and any public duty can be considered to be the public duty only when this is substantive in nature 
so the first condition is that there must be a public duty the second important condition which is required to be fulfilled for the issuance of the writ of mandamus is that there must be a specific demand and the specific refusal there must be the specific demand on the part of the petitioner and there must be the specific refusal on the part of the authority or the agency only then the rate of mandamus lies only then the rate of mandamus can be issued the third important condition is that the petitioner or the applicant seeking the rate of mandamus must have the right to enforce the public duty only those persons can make the application only those persons can initiate can file the petitions for the writ of mandamus who have the right to enforce the duty who have the right to force the authority or the agency to compel the authority or the agency to perform the public duty the fourth condition is that that right of the petitioner to enforce the duty or to compel the authority or the agency to enforce the duty must be subsistent on the date of the petition see the first condition for the writ of mandamus there must be a public duty the public duty means a duty which is created by the constitution a statute or any rules or regulations having the force of law or by some rule of common law in the case of commissioner of police versus gordhan das banji which was decided by the supreme court of india in 1952 the public duty was defined and the characteristics of a public duty were highlighted by the supreme court according to which any duty can be considered to be the public duty if that duty is created by the constitution number 1 number 2 if that duty is created by any statute if that duty is created by any rule having the force of law or that duty is found under any regulation having the force of law even if any duty which is not created by the constitution which is not created by any statute or which is not enforced by any rule having the force of law or which is not found in any regulation having the force of law can also be considered the public duty if that duty is created by any rule of common law so these are the characteristics of any duty which make that duty as the public duty it means that for any duty to be the public duty what should be there either it should have been created by the constitution or it should have been created by the statute any law legislation made by the competent legislature or it should have been created by any rule or it should have been created by any regulation or it should have been created by any rule of common law only then that duty can be considered to be the public duty friends it has also been the requirement for the grant of the writ of mandamus that the public duty must be absolute in nature if any duty is found to be the public duty it is not sufficient for the issue of the writ of mandamus in addition to this what is needed that that public duty must be substantive in nature what does it mean that a public duty must be substantive in nature a duty is considered to be absolute the duty is considered to be substantive in nature if it is mandatory and not as the matter of discretion of 
the authority. So, the duty must be absolute or the duty must be substantive means that that duty must be mandatory in nature and the performance of duty must not be dependent of the discretion of the authority, the discretion of the agency. It means that any duty is the absolute duty when it is mandatory and it is not discretionary. It would also mean that the writ of mandamus lies only for the performance of such public duties which are absolute in nature, which are mandatory in nature and which are not dependent of the discretion of the agency or authority. Only then the writ of mandamus can be issued or the writ of mandamus lies. It means that if there is any mandatory requirement for the performance of any particular duty by the administrative agency, administrative authority under the constitution, under the law, under the rules, under the regulations or even under any rule of common law. If any mandatory obligation has been imposed over the authority, then the mandamus would lie. It means that for the enforcement of discretionary duties, the rate of mandamus would not lie. We can understand the approach of the court, how the courts refuses to issue the rate of mandamus for the performance of discretionary duties. We can refer to the case of Manjula Manjari versus Director of Public Instructions decided by the Supreme Court of India in the year of 1952. The writ of mandamus was sought by the petitioner in this case seeking the direction to the concerned authority, the Director of Public Instructions to compel it or to compel him to include the petitioner's book in the list of approved book. That was the prayer of the petitioner for which the petitioner sought the writ of mandamus. The petitioner wanted to include his book in the list of approved book, approved books and therefore, the petition was filed to have the direction to compel the director public instructions to include her book within the list of approved books. It was found by the court on the examination or appreciation of the material before it that it was matter of absolute discretion of the authority to select the books for including them in the list of approved book. That means that it was the discretionary duty imposed over the authority that was not the mandatory duty. And when the court found that the duty was discretionary in nature, it was not mandatory and the director public instructions had the absolute discretion for selecting the books to include them in the list of approved books, then the court refused to grant the writ of mandamus. Now, the question arises whether any duty is mandatory or not, how to determine, how to know that whether any duty is mandatory or not. It depends on the character of the duty as provided in the institute. For this purpose, what was the intention of the legislature at the time of creating this duty in the institute is very relevant factor to determine whether the duty is discretionary or not, mandatory or not. The relevant considerations for determining whether any duty is mandatory or not, to determine whether any duty is 
absolute in nature or not are the scheme and object and the phraseology of the statute these are three important aspects the scheme of the enactment the object of that enactment and the phraseology adopted by the legislature in enacting that particular provision of the enactment which creates the duty. In addition to this, it is also very important to consider at the time of determining whether any duty created by any statute is mandatory or absolute in nature or not, that what would have been the intention of the legislature in creating this duty and what is the relation or the connection of this provision with the other provisions of the enactment, because it is the established rule of interpretation that the interpretation of any particular provision of the enactment cannot be made in such a manner which makes the other provisions nugatory, which makes the other provisions as useless, which makes the other provisions as worthless. The second condition for the rate of mandamus is that there must be a specific demand and refusal. We must know one particular aspect of the concept of judicial review and also the established principle for the modes of judicial review or for invoking the writ jurisdiction is that the writs are not issued until and unless the alternative remedy has been exhausted by has been availed by the petitioner. If any alternative remedy exists, if the petitioner has not availed that alternative remedy, the rates are not issued. Only exception to this rule is the rate of prohibition, which we discussed in the earlier lecture. In the lecture on the first lecture on the modes of judicial review, that the rate of prohibition is the exception to this rule of alternative remedies and therefore, it becomes important for the rate of mandamus because the rate of mandamus is the general remedy, the rate of mandamus is the judiciary remedy. So, to lower down the burden of the courts and to prevent the frivolous petitions seeking the rate of mandamus it is the condition to be fulfilled by the petitioner that the specific demand was made and against that specific demand made by the petitioner, the authority, the agency refused to give the remedy. We can refer to the case of Navatraya versus Union of India. In the case of Novat Rai versus Union of India, decided by the Punjab High Court in 1953, a person was dismissed from his services in a military form. He was the employee, he was the workman in a military form and his services were dismissed by the authority. It is also important fact that he never requested to the concerned authority for the reconsideration of the decision. He never requested for his reinstatement to the concerned authority on the basis of this that 
the specific demand was not made by the petitioner, though he had the opportunity to avail the alternative remedy, he did not do so. The writ of mandamus was refused by the Punjab High Court on the same basis. But it does not mean that in each and every case, the court is mandatorily to see the specific demand on the part of the petitioner. There may be some situations where the petitioner may not have the opportunity to make the specific demand, demand even if the law permits that alternative remedy. And if in such situations the remedy is not given, that would cause injustice to the petitioner. And therefore, the courts identified some circumstances wherein the specific demand for performance of public duty may not be necessary. See what are these circumstances wherein even if the specific demand was not made by the petitioner, the rate of mandamus may be issued. These are number one, where it appears that the demand is unavailing. Number two, where the conduct of the respondent has made impossible for the petitioner to raise the demand. Number three, where the duty in question of a public nature and nobody is specifically entitled to demand its performance. Number four, where the person concerned has by inadvertence made the omission to do some act which he was obliged to do under the law and the time within which he could do it has expired. These were the conditions in which there shall be the presumption of the specific demand on the part of the petitioner and by assuming that, that the specific demand has been made the rate of mandamus may be issued. The third condition for the issue of the rate of mandamus is there must be a clear right to enforce the duty. The petitioner must have the clear right to enforce the duty to compel the performance of the duty. This essential condition means that right to enforce the duty must belong to the petitioner and that such a right must be subsistent on the date of the petition. There are two aspects of this particular condition. Number one, that right to enforce the duty must belong to the petitioner itself. And number two, that right of the petitioner must be subsistent on the date of the petitioner. It is the settled law that mandamus may not be issued unless there is a clear right of claimant to force the performance of duty imposed on the authority and that right of the petitioner is subsistent on the date or the till the date of the petitioner. In the case of Manocha versus state of MP, the court refused to issue the writ when the petitioner failed to establish his right to be admitted in the college. He could not prove that he had the right to be admitted in the college and then the writ of mandamus was refused. In the case of Union of India versus Orient Enterprises decided by the Supreme Court in 1998, the request for the grant of mandamus was refused on the ground that the right to claim the interest on delayed refund under the Customs Act 1962 was not subsistent at the time of applying for it. Thus, right must be subsisting on the date of the petitioner is also an essential condition for the grant of writ of mandamus. The same approach was adopted by the Supreme Court of India in the case of Shabi Construction Company versus City and Industrial Development Corporation. 
Then what are the grounds for the issue of the writ of mandamus? The writ of mandamus can be issued on all the grounds on which all the other writs are issued. It is very important for us to know that the grounds for the issue of all the writs are similar. These are the grounds to invoke the power of judicial review. So, these are the common, all these grounds are common for all the rates and these grounds are, you will see, you may not be surprised to see that we are finding that in all the rates grounds are the same. So, these grounds are the same for all the rates and these grounds are on which the rate of mandamus can also be issued. The lack of jurisdiction, access of jurisdiction, abuse of jurisdiction, violations of principles of natural justice, infringement of fundamental rights and the error of law. All these grounds we have already discussed in detail under the discussion over the rate of shashorari. There are some grounds on which the rate of mandamus may be refused. The court may refuse to grant the rate of mandamus. The court can deny the request for grant of mandamus on following grounds. Number one, if the adequate alternative remedy is available. So, it is important for the petitioner to exhaust first the alternative remedy. There is unreasonable delay in filing the petition. There is inordinate delay in filing the petition or if the circumstances like latches are existent. When the applica application is found premature, you cannot file the petition for seeking the writ of mandamus at premature stage where the decision has not been made. Unlike the writ of prohibition, because the writ of prohibition is issued to stop the proceedings, but the writ of mandamus cannot be issued at premature stage. When the issue of the writ or the grant of the writ would become infructuous, this is also the condition wherein the writ of mandamus can be refused or the court may not issue the writ of mandamus. The second part of the present lecture is the discussion over the writ of habeas corpus. We have discussed the writ of mandamus, the different aspects of the writ of mandamus. Now, we are going to discuss the writ of habeas corpus. What is the meaning of habeas corpus? What is the meaning of writ of habeas corpus? Habeas corpus is a Latin term and it means to have the body of. The writ of habeas corpus is generally issued to direct or to command the authority for the production of the body of detained or confined person. The writ of habeas corpus is the remedy in the form of the order of the Supreme Court or the High Court by which a person who has been detained or confined by any public or private agency may secure his release. Though we have seen that generally the rates are issued against the public bodies, public authorities. But the writ of habeas corpus may also be issued against the private agencies, even against the private persons. By this writ, the court calls for the explanation and legal justification for the detention and if the court finds that no such legal justification is existent, it orders the release of the person who is in confinement. Under Article 21 of Indian Constitution, 
it is the fundamental right of every person in India, not only the citizens. The word person is used under article 21. So, it is the fundamental right of every person in India that he cannot be deprived, he or she cannot be deprived of his right to life and personal liberty. Article 21 states that no person shall be deprived of his right to life and personal liberty except by the procedure established by law. It means that in certain circumstances, the person may be deprived of his right to life and personal liberty, but it can be done only in accordance with the procedure established by law. And this procedure established by law has been interpreted by the Supreme Court of India in Menka Gandhi case as the procedure established by law which is just, fair and reasonable. It is not sufficient for any procedure to be procedure established by law for the purpose of article 21 that it has been established by the competent legislature. In addition to it, it is also required that that procedure must be fair, reasonable and just. That means that without applying or without the basis of any such procedure which is fair, reasonable and just, no person can be deprived of his right to life and personal liberty. When any person is detained, when any person is confined, Certainly, his right to life and personal liberty is violated and therefore, without legal justification, without the reasonable, fair and just procedure, he should not be confined or detained and therefore, it is the duty of the courts to call for the legal justification behind the action of or the decision of the detention or the confinement. And therefore, by this writ, the court calls for the explanation and legal justification for the detention and if the court finds that no such legal justification is there, it orders the release of the person in confinement. The petition seeking the writ may be filed by any person on behalf of the person in confinement like the writ of co warranto For minors, the person who is entitled for the custody of the minor may file the petition. The person in confinement himself can also file the petition seeking the writ of mandamus. Then see the objectives of the writ of habeas corpus. The writ of habeas corpus may be issued for following purposes. Number one, to examine the legality, orderliness and justification of detention for confinement. To secure the custody of the person under the detention. To direct the authority or person responsible for such confinement for our detention to produce him before the court. The writ of mandamus is also issued for the purpose to ensure the release of a person from any legal and unjustified detention and confinement. An important objective of the writ of habeas corpus is to examine legality and legal justification of detention during emergency, under the preventive detention laws, under the court martial or for the breach of privileges. This is the most significant objective of writ of habeas corpus. To examine the legality and legal justification of detention during emergency, we will discuss 
in the last of the lecture that how the Supreme Court of India decided in ADM Jawalpur case which was criticized all over the country that writ of habeas corpus was not available during the emergency. The preventive detention laws are also very stringent laws wherein a person can be arrested or detained even before the commitment of any offence only on the presumption of or the possibility of any such incidence he can be detained and therefore, it is very important court martial we know that the courts do not have the jurisdiction generally in court martial cases. So, it is very important objective of the writ of habeas corpus to examine the legality and legal justification of detention during emergency under preventive detention laws under the court martial or for the breach of privileges. These are the traditional objectives which we discussed for which the writ of habeas corpus may be issued. In addition to these objectives, the Supreme Court of India has widened the scope of writ of habeas corpus by recognizing new objectives for which the writ of habeas corpus may be issued in the case of Sunil Vatra versus Delhi administration decided in 1980 by the Supreme Court. This case is also known as Sunil Vatra second case. In this case, the Supreme Court treated the letter sent by a prisoner to a judge of the Supreme Court making the complaint of inhuman treatment and torture to fellow prisoner as the petition for the writ of habeas corpus even though there was no request for the release of the prisoner from illegal arrest or detention in the letter. We have been discussing under the meaning of the writ of habeas corpus that writ of habeas corpus is aimed at releasing the persons from illegal detentions, detentions made on no legal justifications. So, this is the writ which is issued generally for the release of the persons from illegal confinements, from illegal detentions. It means that the petition should be filed with the request to release the person from illegal confinement. It also means that the illegal confinement, illegal detention, illegal arrest is the basis of the issue of the writ of habeas corpus. But in this case, the Supreme Court relax the scope of the writ of habeas corpus. Though the letter sent by the prisoner did not contain any request for the release from illegal detention, even though that letter was considered to be the petition for the writ of habeas corpus. In the present case, Justice Krishna Iyer referred to several decisions of US Supreme Court to justify the issuance of writ of habeas corpus for inhuman treatment and torture in jails like congestion due to overcapacity, understaffing, unhygienic and unhealthy facilities, brutality, constant apprehensions of violence, insufficient medical and health facilities, inhuman seclusion and lack of the programs for education, training and rehabilitation of prisoners. So, for these purposes also the writ of habeas corpus may lie according to Justice Krishna here that if any inhuman treatment and torture is made in the jails like congestion and due the over capacity under staff in the jails, unhygienic and unhealthy facilities, brutality, constant apprehension of violence, insufficient medical and health facilities, inhuman seclusion and lack of the programs for education, training and rehabilitation of prisoners. 
it is also important to note that the principle of res judicata is not applicable to the writ of habeas corpus. In the case of Gulam Sarwar versus Union of India decided in 1967 by the Supreme Court, the apex court has held that if the petition seeking the writ of habeas corpus has already heard by the high court and it has been rejected, the petitioner can file a press petition before the Supreme Court under Article 32 of Indian Constitution. The principle of res judicata is not applicable. In the case of Lallu Bhai versus Union of India, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 1981, the Indian Supreme Court observed that if the High Court has rejected the writ petition to challenge an order of detention, the petitioner is entitled to file another petition on any other ground to challenge the legality of continued detention and it cannot be considered to be barred by the principle of res judicata. It means the principle of res judicata is not applicable to the writ of habeas corpus. Friends, in English law, the appeal is not allowed against the order of the court granting the writ of habeas corpus. If the writ of habeas corpus has been granted by the court, the appeal does not lie against such a decision of the court. But in India, the appeal can be filed against the order of the high court in both the conditions whether it has been granted or refused by the high court. The case of A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras is also important to be referred at this point of our discussion. In this case, the writ of habeas corpus, it was held by the court that the writ of habeas corpus can be filed to challenge the constitutional validity of law under which the detention has been made. The writ of habeas corpus cannot be filed only for the purpose to challenge the illegal detention, to challenge the constitutional validity of the law under which the detention was made the writ of habeas corpus can be filed. It was settled by the Supreme Court of India in A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras case. A.D.M. Jawalpur versus Sivakan Shukla, it is also very important case in the history of writ of habeas corpus. It is also considered to be a blot on the golden history of Indian jurisprudence on judicial review. In the case of ADM Jawalpur versus Shivagan Shukla, it was held that during the emergency, the writ of habeas corpus was not available. The Supreme Court held that during the emergency, a detention order cannot be challenged even for being ultra virus, the act or malafide, or it is based on extraneous considerations. Even on these grounds, the writ of habeas corpus cannot be filed. It was decided in this case. We know under Article 359, the enforcement of fundamental rights may be suspended by an order of the president. Before 44th Amendment, the president could enforce the, could suspend the enforcement of all the fundamental rights during the emergency by issuing an order. And therefore, it was decided by the court in this case that the doors of the courts are completely shut during the emergency, even the writ of habeas corpus could not be issued. Then the Indian legislature amended Article 359 and exceptions article 20 and 21 are made the exceptions or exemptions to the suspension of the enforcement of fundamental rights. Now, the president cannot suspend the enforcement of article 20 and 21 even during the emergency. So, now the writ of habeas corpus is available even during the emergency 
the person under the detention or any person on behalf of him can go to the court seeking the writ of habeas corpus and now the doors of the courts are not completely shut for the purpose of the issuance of the writ of habeas corpus. So, this is all about the modes of the judicial review which we discussed in earlier lecture and in the present lecture. These are five, the writ of certiorari, the writ of prohibition, the writ of co warranto, the writ of mandamus and the writ of habeas corpus. The courts can provide the remedy for any injustice caused to the individuals by issuing these kind of rates. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said, but also in what remains unsaid. Today I will be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered. And Indeed, the very charm of this particular story that I am going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends. It is an ancient tale from Mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of Somerset Mom stands out. Uh, the adaptation that I will be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that Mom wrote. The story is titled in all of its adaptations almost as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty handed. Indeed, the servant had all gone white and trembling with fear, he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace. When I entered the market, the servant said to his master, I was jostled by a woman and when I turned to look at her, I saw that she was death. I am very scared, master, because death looked at me with a threatening gesture. Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death? The master, being a good man, gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death. Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? Asked the master to death. And death replied, it was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today because this evening, I have an appointment with him in Samara. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet.